Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming in such a difficult day. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Shep Doleman. Uh, Shep is an astronomer at the uh, Center for Astrophysics at Harvard, and he is also the principal investigator of the Next Generation Event Horizon Telescope and a founding director of the EHT. Uh, Shep is here in Argentina, invited by the Ministry of Science to participate in the Shama workshop that will be held in Salta province next week. And he arrived in Argentina just this morning, so we appreciate very much his effort to come here and give us uh, this lecture about the recent discoveries made by the Event Horizon Telescope. So Shep, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Too. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I'm used to getting off planes and coming directly to give talks. So this is this is nothing new. But uh, when you travel around the world, you kind of have to be ready for anything. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to, to talk with you. I'm here as uh, as was mentioned because I want to go learn about the the JAMA telescope and to understand how we might join forces to do some really interesting things, make movies of black holes. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the of the talk. But really what I want to do is, is generally describe for you uh, how we built this project called the EHT and what we did and where we want to go in the future and some of the details that you may not have heard about that uh, were necessary and some of the challenges that were required to overcome for this. And this was motivated really by the idea that we could test Einstein's theory close to the black hole boundary. There are very few places we can think of where Einstein's theory will be violated and the edge of a black hole is one of them. And I'm not going to keep you in suspense. You know, we did succeed in testing Einstein's uh, theory very, very close to the black hole. On the left, you see here the six and a half billion solar mass black hole around M87, and then the one on the right in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. So we have been able to make these extraordinarily detailed images of these environments around black holes. And, and more than that, we do hope to say something about how black holes accrete. So having this window into this inner area around the black hole, we hope to be able to say something about how jets are formed and how matter accretes. That's me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm going to skip through some of the introduction here. I mean, I'm sure that many of you have seen this movie Interstellar, right? Because we all know now that what's inside of a black hole is a big bookcase. And you can communicate from inside of a black hole through the power of love with your, <laughs> with your, uh, with your siblings and your daughters. Um, but th there are some things here that uh, they got right with the computer-generated algorithms and some things that they got terribly wrong. Right? So for example, you, you do see this idea here that if you have an accretion flow around the black hole, part of it is lens up over the top, part of it is lens down below. You never want to try to hide behind a black hole because there is no behind of the black hole. And you see this thin ring here is the last photon orbit. That marks the place where light must circle around the black hole due to the warped gravity and the warped space time. Now we know that this is pretty much what we expected because in 1979, this visionary French astronomer, Jean-Pierre Luminet, wrote down a lot of the equations that govern this. And he showed that if you had a disk orbiting the black hole, you would indeed see this kind of structure. And he got right back in 1979 using the very early computers, this inner ring here and this lensing over the top, right? So we knew what we were looking for and he identified this region here, the shadow. And the size of that shadow is directly related to Einstein's equation. So if we can measure that, if we can lay a ruler across space time, we'd be able to test, to test this theory. And Jean-Pierre Luminet made this now iconic image, and he created this using Canson negative paper with a pointless technique. He actually drew with India ink all the dots you see here in negative to make this image from an IBM uh, computer at the time. And then, not being one to, uh, to just rest on his laurels, he made the first animation of this. So if you want to know who made the first movie of Black Hole, it wasn't 
Steven Spielberg or anyone else. It was this guy, Jean-Pierre Luminet in France, who was drawing it by hand. Um, oh, there's a little bit of a, you can't really see, somehow the image got a little bit garbled uh, coming through here. But this is also very old. And one of the nice things about this project is that we do shake hands across a, a, a hundred years with Einstein, with Schwarzschild, with the people that come up with these theories. This is a drawing from a book by Max von Laue in 1921. And he asked the question, if you looked at a black hole, what would you see? How big would it be? And we all know that the event horizon here, two times Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of the black hole divided by c squared, somehow is responsible for that shadow. Things that fall within that shadow then are black to us. We cannot see them. But that does not really define how big the black hole would look. And what Max von Laue did was he fired imaginary photons back from the Earth. And he realized that it was when these photons were just captured on that photon orbit. That defined the shadow. Anything interior to that would appear darker. Everything outside of that would escape from the black hole. So it's really this photon orbit, 3 gm over c squared, which defines the size of this shadow and its lensing. And you can go through Einstein's equations and you find out that the diameter of this shadow is the square root of 27. I don't have any mystical explanation for why it's the square root of 27, times the Schwarzschild radius, just a handful of constants. So the key thing is that the space-time is so warped near the black hole that it determines all of the brightness distribution we should see to first order. So if we could see this ring, we would then have a handle on these fundamental concepts like mass and the prediction of Einstein. So there we are. This is, this is what you would wind up seeing at the Earth. Um, now, Bardeen in 1973 said, what if the black hole is spinning? And then you do wind up with a foreshortening of the shadow here, and it shifts over to the right. And one of our students shows this animation as you go higher and higher in spin. It remains circular until the very last moment, and then it gets flat on one side and it shifts continually over. This is very, very difficult to measure because the size of the shadow does not change too much with spin. It's very, very insensitive to the spin of the black hole, but we'll talk about how to measure spin a little bit later in the talk. Okay, so I want to hurry up here a little bit. So just a, a, an idea of how this happens is you have three-dimensional photons coming from all different directions, and they get lensed around, and you wind up getting this feature here that I talked to you about before, this photon ring, with all of the tufty emission, all of the, the larger scale emission around, coming from the plasma that's orbiting the black hole. And this plasma will typically be tens or even hundreds of billions of degrees in temperature. So this gives the size there that I showed you before. And a number of people, you know, including you know, Heino Falke and his collaborators early on in the 2000s, and then Broderick et al., and uh, the, the GAMI group in the University of Illinois, simulated what you would see. And in all these simulations, you see that telltale circle, which is the last photon orbit. That's what we're trying to measure. So all of these different simulations point us in the same direction. Now, do, or do these exist outside? You know, would we be able to, to see these? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is Hercules A. It's, it's a galaxy billions of light years from us. And we think that at the center of this, there exists a, a supermassive black hole weighing billions of times what our sun does. What I'm showing you here is just the optical light. But if you look at the radio, you see something very, very strange, right? You see these classic jets coming out. So you, and you know, the power in here is something like 20, you know, billion supernovae going off over many, many millions and millions of years. And the only thing that we know that can generate something like that is the twisting magnetic fields due to an accretion flow here, then they accelerate particles from the North and South Pole. So we'd like to zoom in on this photograph by about a factor of a million in order to see if this prediction is borne out. Uh, the other place, or the, the first and best place to look for this is of course the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And if you zoom in, uh, it's very centered here, and look in the radio, you see streamers of hot ionized gas falling into the center of our galaxy. And this dot here almost certainly marks the position of about a four million solar mass black hole. And through the work of Andrea Ghez and Reinhard Genzel, we now have very good evidence, not, not final or conclusive evidence, but extremely good evidence that there's something dark in here 
that's tossing these planets, or the toss, tossing these stars around as if they were planets. So the evidence is just about overwhelming that there has to be a very, very massive object there. Uh, and this is what we've seen in the center of the, the Milky Way galaxy. So we now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the case. Because what you're seeing here is 4 million times the mass of the sun constrained to lie within the photon orbit. Now, the, the closest those stars orbit the black hole is about 1,000 Schwarzschild radii. But this is only a few Schwarzschild radii from the central black hole. So we've zoomed in by nearly a factor of 1,000. And this provides the conclusive proof that we're looking at a black hole. The other source that we were interested in was M87. M87 is another iconic source. You see here at lower frequencies, there's a jet coming out one side, it smacks, it collides with the inner galactic medium. Same thing over here. The reason you don't see a jet on the other side is because it's Doppler boosted away from us. That means that this jet is coming almost directly at us. It's only about 17 degrees off from our line of sight. And over a magnification factor of about 10,000, you just see this same self-similar jet. And we had not been able to resolve this central pixel here. And now we know, again, we have about six and a half billion times the mass of the sun, again, within the photon orbit. So we now have two instances, and we'll talk about why that's important a little bit later. And this, of course, is the optical um, identification of this jet, which was seen by Curtis in 1918. So again, another 100-year handshake going back on some of these sources. So, so we have this. Uh, we have these are these were our two targets, and we needed to get tens of micro arc seconds resolution because the size of this compared with the distance gives us a size of about 20 to 40 micro arc seconds at the very beginning of this project. We didn't know what the mass was, and for a Sagittarius A star, we knew we needed to get to within about 50 micro arc seconds. So the name of the game was how do we get the resolution that we need? And let's talk about lambda. Okay, so. We could have some mixture of lambda and diameter of the dish to get us the angular resolution we want. But it turns out that right around the submillimeter here, Sagittarius A star peaks in its intensity. Okay? What's more, it begins to turn over here. So it starts to become optically thin. That's important because when you're surrounded by billions of degrees of gas, you need to be able to see through all of that hot gas to the event horizon. That is a hard thing to do, right? Because you know, many wavelengths will not penetrate that hot gas. But when you start to turn over and become optically thin here, that's possible. And what I'll show you here is what these black holes look like as you increase the frequency. At first, the event horizon is obscured, and then you wind up seeing that photon ring. And what's more, not only do you see the photon ring, but you can see the activity around the photon ring. So we're getting as up close and as personal with these black holes as we could ever hope to, become, to get. So we know that we need an observing wavelength of around one millimeter. But that's, where that, that, that's where that simulation became transparent. And the only way that we can do this is to develop a telescope that's 10,000 kilometers across. And to do this, we use this magic, which I was exposed to first as a graduate student called Very Long Baseline Interferometry. And it's a way to turn the Earth into a telescope. You have two telescopes, like the ones just out here, but a little bit different on different parts of the Earth. They're all looking at the black hole at the same time. And you receive the radio waves, and you record them, and you time tag them. But you time tag them with an atomic clock, which only loses about one second every 10 million years or so. OK, so extremely accurate. All the waves, all the troughs, all the crests of the radio waves coming through are exactly tagged, so you can compare them later. They're recorded on a hard disk drive, brought to a central correlation facility. And they're there combined, just as an optical dish will combine all the waves that hit its surface at the camera, at the focus. We delay all that and do that in a supercomputer here at the correlator. Each of these stations is recording many, many petabytes. And that's because we can't compress the data. People ask a lot of, all the time, well, why don't you just compress the data, make a, a zip file? And it'll be so much easier to send it through. But before we combine the data, there can be no compression because bit for bit, Nyquist sample by Nyquist sample, we must compare all of the, all the data. Once it's compared, then we can decimate the data by billions. Okay, so many, many petabytes turn into megabytes. But before that, that's impossible. 
And thankfully, for a number of reasons, the Earth rotates, right? So uh, one different, one baseline here, one of these lines gives you one sample from the image. And we make a network of these, and we change the look direction and the orientation and the projected length of all of these connections. And you wind up filling an Earth-sized aperture, not completely, but enough so that we can take a picture of a black hole. And for those of you, of course, who know Fourier transforms, each of these points here on this east-west spatial frequency and north-south uh, north spatial frequency plot represents the Fourier components of the image on the sky. So it's really the Fourier inversion of all the complex data on this plane that give us the, uh, the image of the black hole. And the last part of this was, I'm going into some early history here, was there anything to see? Because this whole project would have been stopped at its tracks if we had done some simple early experiments and found that the size was very big. Because then we would have known we couldn't see all the way to the event horizon. So in 2006 and 2007, we staged an experiment to Hawaii, to California, and Arizona. And we observed at this frequency of 1.3 millimeters. And what you expect to see on the short baseline, where lambda over d is big, if, if, if Sagittarius A star had a finite size, you would still expect to see all the energy, right? Because lambda over d is so big, you're, you can receive all of the energy from that large object. Okay, so that's shown here with this. But on the long baselines here, you would begin to resolve out some of that structure because the lambda over d, the beam of your interferometer, gets smaller. And this is exactly what we saw. On the short baselines, all the correlated flux density that we associated with this object, we could see. We recovered all of that energy. But on the long baselines here, we received a vastly reduced amount of data. So this is exactly what we expected for a source of finite size. And we were able to measure the size to be just a few times the short star radius. So now we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was something to observe. Okay, so we had the technique, we knew what frequency to observe, we had the theory, and finally we had an object that was cooperative, right? Nature is not always cooperative, but so it's good when nature cooperates. We did the same thing for M87, so now we had a second source. I'm not gonna go into all of this except to say that M87 is a completely different object where Sagittarius star is very, very quiet. It has an Eddington ratio of about 10 to the minus eight, so it's eating from the nearby gas very, very daintily. It's not really accreting too much at all. M87 is an Eddington ratio of about 10 to the minus four. That's enough to power a relativistic jet that distributes matter and energy on cosmic scales. So very, very different animals in the night sky. And we found a size here of about five and a half short star radii. Now the other thing that made this possible was a breakthrough in technology. So we had been building these very long baseline interferometric systems by hand. Like it, every, every new system that we made, we would build from first principles with analog electronics, with filter banks, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. And the progress was very, very slow in bandwidth, right? Because the signal-to-noise ratio of a two-pair interferometer goes as the square root of bandwidth, right? So the, the bigger the bandwidth, the bigger the signal-to-noise ratio you can get. But thankfully, we started building our equipment with commercial off-the-shelf technology. We would simply buy computers and put together these systems from like Amazon and so forth. And you can see here the Moore's Law curve in blue, and all of our systems over, over nearly two decades followed this Moore's Law because we used industry components. Right? So we started off here. This is what I did my graduate work on, reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape recorders. And then we had this idea to move completely to digital. So all of those filter banks are on this one little chip underneath this heat sink. And all that reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder is happening with these banks of hard disk drives. And now we are recording at, uh, well, this, this is a 32 gigabits per second system, but now we're recording at 64 gigabits per, se per, se per second. And this is the kind of system that is going to all the different telescopes around the globe. Okay. So to put, to put this in perspective, if you want to observe with very long baseline interferometry on national facilities, they are still at about two gigabits per second. So we are about a factor of 100 beyond even the current national facilities. So to do what we did, you needed to make this leap of a factor of 100. 
Um, so but right before I get to this experiment, I just want to call out that a separate, complete international project was in parallel here, and that was to phase up Alma. Because in addition to the bandwidth, you also want steel. Nothing really replaces gigantic telescopes. Like bandwidth can help a lot, but having a big telescope is very critical. So we built a whole coalition here of international partners to phase up all 60 dishes at the Alma site in Chile. And that, in a single stroke, increased the single to noise ratio by about a factor of 10 for the entire array. And in April 2017, all of these sites, the IRAM 30 meter, the large millimeter telescope in Mexico, the SMT in Arizona, two sites, SMA and JCMT in Hawaii, the South Pole Telescope at, you guessed it, the South Pole, and OPEX and ALMA at the ALMA site here participated. We had great weather, not unlike the weather we have today, which is kind of amazing. And it, it all worked. We had detections to all of our sites. That is also somewhat rare, and I'll talk about that at the end of the talk, too, why you need contingency against weather. I'm not going to say we're lucky, because luck means that we have no control over it, but we were prepared when the weather was excellent. That's very, very important. Okay, so we did actually pack up data. So it still blows my mind that we're freezing light, we're storing photons on hard disk drives. We're shipping those across the globe, right? Here you see Andrew packing up photons at the South Pole, okay? Here are the photons arriving with a FedEx truck at Haystack Observatory. Here we're unloading them with a forklift, okay? Here we're unpacking them, and here they're warming up because you gotta warm the photons up. You gotta warm the disk drives up so that before you start spinning them. Um, now this is not the first time people have shipped a lot of data around. Uh, in 1956, this is what five megabytes of storage looked like. <laughs> so we are not the first people to do this. We were just doing it in the next generation. <laughs> now when you first got the data, uh, and again, I'm showing you the same plot that I showed you before. This is energy on a given baseline pair versus the baseline length. We could see right away something was going on. You try to model this with a Gaussian. The Fourier transform of a Gaussian is, of course, a Gaussian. And you can't match all these points. When you start to do something uh, like a disk, which has a hard edge, then you get that ringing in the Fourier plane. You get nulls, but they don't match. And it's when you have a ring that you begin to match these null spacings. And when you have a crescent, which you expect for certain astro physical reasons, then you get a whole family of curves that exactly fit this. So even when we just looked at the data points without making an image, we knew right away that we had something quite interesting. And we developed specialized algorithms to do the imaging, because you'll see here, we don't have all the Fourier spatial frequencies to make the image. There are big holes here. And every time you have a hole, that signifies a way that you could make an alternate image, which meets all of the requirements of the data, but looks different from the actual thing that's on the sky. Okay? So this represents our ignorance of what the image looks like. So we use regularized maximum likelihood methods, which take the chi-squared data as one of the key things to hold on to, one of the key figures of merit. But we also regularize it, essentially smoothing over some of these areas. And we try to be very light, very careful with these regularizers. We ask that the image be positive. We ask that the image be real everywhere. These are relatively easy to do. And we ask that the image taper off on very large scales. So we, even with just a little bit of regularization, we're able to quickly make these images because the signature of that bounce is so clear. Right? For Sagittarius, it was not this way, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But for M87, we had a lot of data, and the signal was extremely clear. So now I'll tell you a little bit about how we did this. Uh, we split up into, into four teams because we did not want there to be groupthink. We didn't want everyone to be sitting in one room and say, okay, we found a ring. We wanted to split it up. So each of these four teams got the data, but they did not speak to each other. And they did not give each other progress. So nobody knew what was going on between the teams. And as I, I maybe you've seen this before, but you know, the, the reason for this is that it's hard to tell the difference between labradoodles and fried chicken, right? Um, and it's even harder to tell the difference between chihuahuas and blueberry muffins. So I didn't want everybody sitting in the room thinking we were looking at a muffin when we're actually not looking at a muffin. 
I, uh, the, the credit for this goes to my wife, who uses this for her talks uh, about artificial intelligence. So, so we came together uh, at the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard University, and we got the good news that each of the different teams had seen essentially the same morphology, same size, same shape, you know, some a little bit um, more uncertain than others, but many across different kinds of techniques, including clean and regularized maximum likelihood, we're seeing this iconic shape. And then we went through a very long and careful process to make sure that we knew what we were looking at. So the first thing we did was we imaged a quasar, which had been looked at alternately with M87. This is not just a different day. This is not just a different time. These observations were interleaved with M87, and that's quite important because you, don't, you want these observations to be as close to M87 as you can get them. And by looking every other minute at this source, we made this image, right? And it was also the same across all of these different techniques that shows a core and a jet. So exactly what you would expect from a far more distant but even more luminous quasar. We saw what we expected. So, Sorry, yeah. but this is a very variable source. It's not, uh, there is not uh, an effect of variability introduced because of this? Oh, so, so 3C279 does not vary on the time scale of a day. I mean, it, 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 there's, some, there's some interday variability, but on these size scales, you would not expect to see big, big shape variations. What typically what you might see is that this central uh, core here might brighten a little bit, but there's very little way that you can get a big structural change over the course of a day. But these are, you're right, these are variable but they don't affect this particular test. And also, this is a very good question because we observed this all four days, and this source also did not change over all four days. So why, while, three, while 279 does experience variability, we did not observe it during this period here. So this, this gave us confidence that when we did not expect to see a ring, we didn't see a ring. And also, in all four days, as with 279, we saw the same ring with the same basic size. Now, there is some changes here. Uh, there are some changes here. And we can talk about that you know, near the end of the talk. And we hope to make time-lapse movies of this source by stitching together weekly observations of m Now, of course, it's very important to have location. That's one of the reasons that I wanted to get on a plane and come here, because I want to hear more about the telescopes that are being built locally in the Southern Hemisphere. So with two source, with two antennas here, you can only say very little about the source structure. Uh, when you have a site down here in South America, you can look at very small objects, but you can't see the ring. It's only when you start getting outriggers, first in Hawaii, and then in, uh, in Spain, with the full extent of the array, that you can pull this together. So this really is a global effort. We can't do this without partners all over the globe. So now I want to give you a, a, a taste of what we did and how we measured this. So there are many different ways you can measure the diameter of this ring, right? You can model fit. You can uh, you can trace the ridge line, as I'll show you here, and you can also run GRMHD simulations and find out which simulations on a template fit the data. But what we did first of all was we just traced the ridge line around here. And you get a very good idea of the width of the ring, the size of the ring, and the azimuthal symmetry. And for a, a black hole that's not spinning, we would expect, as I showed you before, the angular shadow diameter to be the square root of 27 factor times the Schwarzschild radius. But you've got to put this d in here. The d is the distance to the object, because you don't know how big it should be uh, even though you might know its mass, you don't know how big it should be on the sky until you know the distance. Now, thankfully, we do know the distance to M87 from, from stellar observations, so we know how far away it is. But the size it is on the sky depends on the distance. So you wind up with this, um, with this equation where you have the square root of 27 times the angular shadow diameter. Okay, so we measure the diameter and uncertainty here, and there's a problem. So, so it, it, it should be simple, right? We should measure the size of the ring, we should look at the square root of 27. We should measure the mass of the black hole. If it matches the mass that we get from other means, that would be a very strong test of Einstein's theory. But here's the problem. 
This is a simulation of one of these black holes. And you see very clearly that photon ring. But there's this very faint, it's hard to see here, but there's very faint emission all around the black hole. And that biases our measurement of the black hole to be a little bit bigger than it actually is. So here's in white here, you see the actual photon ring size. You bring it down. Did you guys see that? It was something that came. OK, so you want to trace this. But when you actually trace the ridge line, it's a little bit bigger. It's kind of hard to see on this screen. But the black circle here is a little bit bigger than the white circle. OK, so how do we take that into account? Well, we ran hundreds of computer simulations of what a black hole might look like. For each of these simulations, we knew what the photon ring was. And then we ran it through a simulator which created fake data as though we had observed it with the Event Horizon Telescope. We, we imaged it, and we found empirically how much bigger the ridge line was than the actual photon orbit. And we did this hundreds and hundreds of times. right? And we were able to find uh, the uncertainty on a formal basis for all of those simulations. And we wind up getting that, uh, if you assume the distance is about 16.8 megaparsecs, then you have the mass of the black hole to be 6.5 billion solar masses, which is what you get when you look at the stars moving around the central cluster of M87. So most of this uncertainty here is due to this process. It's due to this need of empirically calibrating the real photon ring to what we actually measure. And so I'll, I'll show you a little bit later, we can do much better than this. So where are we for M87? Uh, we have this mass. We laid a ruler across space-time. We measured the mass of this black hole. It agrees with dynamical measurements of stars. <laughs> it's circular. Remember I said it's coming at us with about a 17-degree offset? So we would expect under any circumstances this to be very circular. And it is to within 10%. There's asymmetry. You see the bottom is bright. The top is dim. That's because of near light speed motions around the black hole. So when you run these simulations in supercomputers, you do see that there's a circularization around the black hole. The gas is coming towards us on the bottom and away from us on the top. And for those of you, I'm sure everybody here has taken general relativity. Raise your hand if you have not taken general relativity. <laughs> Okay, this, is like, this is unforgivable, but, <laughs> but so one person has not taken it. It's okay, it's okay. Cool. Um, so when a charged particle goes close to the speed of light, of course, all of its emission gets beamed in the direction. I'm going to teach gravity for right now. So with, when a charged particle is moving at the speed of light, not only is, is the frequency shifting a little bit, but actually all the energy is constrained to be beamed in the direction it's moving. Right? So this shows you that all of the light, all the matter here is coming towards us, it's beamed towards us. And here it's moving away from us, it's still emitting, but everybody on the other side, the aliens on the other side of the galaxy, they're seeing the top, which is brighter. All this is synchrotron radiation by the thermal gas. Exactly. I, I should have said that on, the, on the, 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 um, the energy distribution diagram that I showed before, where it turns over. But this is all synchrotron emission. So this is charged particles orbiting very quickly around magnetic fields. Okay. So that, that's, a very, that's a very important point, because these, these shine brightly in the synchrotron spectrum because there are magnetic fields and because there's an abundance of relativistic charged particles. And that has implications for polarization. Exactly, exactly. So, so all, all of this should be polarized. And I, I think I have a picture of the pol I may not have it. I think I do. So I'd we'll love to see it in the next couple of slides. But you should be able to tease out the orientation of the magnetic field looking at the polarized light from this source. Um, so, so we're consistent with Einstein's theory at about the 17% level. And that, again, that's due to this empirical process we had to go through of simulating many times and just trying to guess at what the relationship was between the true photon ring and the one we observed. Um, and what I like about this also is that you can use the right-hand rule and you can measure the spin of the black hole. So if you take your thumb and point it in the direction of this arrow here, and your fingers come up like this, then these, this is the bright part coming towards you, this is the dim part going away from you, and so the north pole, the spin, has to be oriented slightly into the page and down. Okay, so this is the first time we've actually been able to see the orientation of the spin of the black hole. 
Now, why did it take us another two years to come with the image of Sad J Star? I know everyone was very impatient, we were impatient, but we finally got there. But one of the reasons that it's difficult is because of scattering. Because Sagittar exists in the plane of our galaxy, we view it through a lot of ionized gas, which preferentially scatters the long wavelength emission. So if you try to make an image of Sag star like this one at three millimeters wavelength, then this is what it looks like in the computer, but this is what it looks like after you scatter it. It's completely impossible to make this measurement at three millimeters. At 1.3 millimeters, the scattering goes down by about a factor of 10. You can start to make out that shadow. So we were able to do this at one millimeter. And at 0.8 millimeters, it's even a, 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 a more slight effect, right? It's a, not, a, not as big an effect. So we'd like to move to this frequency here. But this is one of the reasons it took us a long time, because we had to try to mitigate, take this scattering out of the, of the processing. The other is, this is the hardest one. The hardest one is that because Sagittarius A star is a thousand times lighter, it's a thousand times less massive, it changes its appearance every half an hour because the orbital period is about half an hour for matter to go around Sag A star. So while you're looking at it during an evening, it's changing its appearance. So you can't add all the data you would normally get in order to make one still image. You have to take into account the fact that it's moving. And, and this just shows that. So here's the M87 data, and you can see that at any one of these baselines, the data does not vary too much up and down. Look at the Sag star data. It was horrible. <laughs> I gotta say it's horrible. I mean, it was challenging, right? Because you, you, you can just see here that, on, especially on these long baselines, you're seeing small scale changes on the, at the black hole boundary because these points are jumping up and down. They are not constant during the course of an evening. So we had to carefully figure out how we could average, when we could average, spatially average, temporally average. That's what took us those extra two years to come with an algorithm that we could test with simulated data that we knew always gave us pretty good results. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit faster here. But uh, so th then we went through a big process of trying to make that image go away for Sag star. So we trained our, all of our algorithms on things that were not a ring. We trained it on doubles. We trained it on point sources with a halo, right? We, changed, we trained it on simple disks, on elliptical disks. We trained these algorithms so they faithfully reproduced all of these shapes that were not the ring. And then we turned these algorithms loose on the, on the real data and they all, for the most part, produced rings. So we were very confident that no matter how we train these algorithms, they were insensitive to the regularizers that we were using in this method. And we generated, you know, actually it's hundreds of thousands, but really close to a million images through this process. And here's what we found. We found that of all of these images, they could be grouped into about four main different types. And it had to do with the azimuthal distribution of light around the ring. So you had some that looked like this, some that had different patches. Uh, this one is brighter on this side. And there were about 2% of the images that were not truly rings. Okay, this is the part where I actually admit that we don't always know what we're doing. Um, but when you average all these and you weight them appropriately, you get something like this. Now you could ask yourself, well, if we have 2% of the images that are not a ring, how certain are you of the ring? Uh, I'm very certain, and one of the re and the reason is that because when you try to simulate images that have no ring component, you never accidentally get a ring component. So if you simulate a double, there's no process that we can possibly think of that would create a ring. Okay, so the fact that we see all these rings convinces us that we're not seeing something that's truly not a ring. And more than that, when you take a ring with synthetic data and you run it through our entire analysis change, chain, you get on order of 2% non-ring sources. This is just part of the statistical process that you go through. So everything that we've done suggests that we are looking at a ring and we expect to see this small slice of the distribution that are not, that are not rings. The interesting thing though is, is also that even though this is not a full ring, these points are mimicked all across here. 
So we think this is just one case where it locked on to one time when this third component over here was dim, and we're just not seeing the full ring. Uh, so you can model this, and this is what we did. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here, but we used about a 13-component model, and you can see how very carefully it can match the images that we made, and that's how we pulled out the diameter of the ring. Um, and you see here the, the, image, the movie that I showed you before. This is the prediction from the orbits of these stars on how big the shadow should be, and this is the range of the measurement that we got from the Event Horizon Telescope. So, very strong match to the predictions of Einstein for this case where we know the mass perfectly to about 1%. Um, and I, just to, I, I like to show this just because we use different uh, software packages. We use the Haystack Observatory Processing Suite of software and CASA, which has been used by many, many astronomers, radio astronomers around the world. And you can compare the diameter and the width of the ring and they're very, very similar. So even across software packages, we're getting the same kind of, of size. So here, just the, 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 the cheat sheet, if you will, for Sag J star is that we all, we get this ring diameter, the width is about 30%. Uh, the derived mass is very, very close to the mass you get from stellar orbits. Uh, their mass is probably better because we still have to empirically size that ring. We still have to empirically run through all these simulations where we know what the photon ring size is and we take the measured one in the synthetic data. Uh, we're still corroborating GR about the 10% level, so we need to get closer in here. And this is the best existence, the best evidence for the existence of supermassive black holes. There, I said it. I think this is the best <laughs> evidence for the existence of supermassive black holes because we've gotten so close and there's nowhere for any other mass distribution to hide interior to our, our evidentiary um, observations. Now, the other question we get often is, where's the jet? You would expect for these black holes to launch a jet. We don't see one. We just don't see evidence for a jet. There's a couple of possibilities. If this is face-on, then the jet might be coming towards us again. You might not see. It might be very diffuse because it's coming right at us. Um, or it may be a different kind of energetic situation. It may be an episodic jet, but we just don't see anything yet. Future observations will nail that down, though. I have a question. Yeah. For, for this map, you have a, a, a obtained. So the, the diameter of the typical size you obtain is about 5m, right? For the radius, right? 5m. For the radius is 5m. 5m. So the, the, the last uh, stable orbit, you're still looking for a solution to, to get 3m, right? You cannot resolve down to the photon ring. Okay, so there are two orbits. So the photon ring is, is you know, should be 3m, and then that's lensed to the 5.2, the square root of 27. But you said the innermost stable orbit. So do you mean matter orbits? Oh, no, or the, photon, the, pho the, the, the photon, photon orbit. The photon orbit. Yeah, so, so I'm sorry, so your question was? If uh, that you need more solution, right, to, to really capture the, the circularization Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I think I have a slide on that, and that's exactly what I'm, we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Because that would be even more that kind of conclusive evidence for the, the kind of black exactly. hole. Exactly. Yeah. I, I didn't say this was the end of the... Look, look, when Galileo invented the telescope, it wasn't the end of astronomy, it was the beginning of astronomy, <laughs> right? So, so I'm not under any illusions that we're not... There isn't a few things in front of us. So this is this is exactly right. We're, we're just asking the next set of questions, and that's the nice yeah. thing about this. Right? Um, and I'll show you. I, I think I have another slide on that, so I'll talk about that. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. I'm just going to say that we're very excited about the Sag J star results because Sag J star lives in our galaxy, and we know a lot about all the different bodies and orbits and uh, constituents of the center of our galaxy. So understanding now more about the black hole is going to uh, impact many different fields that people, that people study. Um, so now I want to talk about a very, very briefly the, the next generation EHT. Um, I'm going to talk much more about this at the conference at SALTA, so I'm not going to tell you everything here, um, but except to say that we want to move to, um, you know, I don't have that slide, but I'm going to, at the end I'm going to call it up because you asked that question, so don't, don't worry, okay. don't be afraid, I'm going to, I'm going to get to that. Okay. 
So we asked ourselves, okay, where can we put new telescopes? All the blue points here are the existing telescopes that we use, and the red points are not complete set of mountaintops and areas that are above about 2,000 meters. We might put new sites, and of course, you see the Yama telescope is, is right here, so we've been keeping our eye on all the developments here in Argentina. Um, even in, in uh, Antarctica, we, we dream about going to Antarctica sometimes. And, and there, if you added up all those sites and you went also to 200 to 345 gigahertz, that sparse sampling of the Fourier plane now turns into something like this. Now you get so much data, you can make very high dynamic range images. So you wind up seeing not just the inner black hole here, but you can resolve the low surface brightness jet. Right? And you can see here how that works with the regularized maximum likelihood. It immediately locks on because you have all these Fourier spatial frequencies to all this uh, low surface brightness jet emission. So we'll be able to study the energy extraction from black holes, not just the dynamics around the black hole itself. And more than that, we'll be able to make movies. Because if we can observe this every three days or every week, this is the simulation over here, and this is what we hope to do with the next generation of M-Horizon Telescope. So real black hole cinema is possible within this next decade. This is going to require many sites. This will require Yama. This will require new sites, potentially in Argentina, in Chile, in America, in Antarctica potentially, and also in Europe. So again, it's about location, 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 and building out this array is, is critical. And then for Sagittarius A star, remember, it changes its shape every 10 minutes or so. So you need to look at the snapshot coverage. So in the, in the inset here, you'll see all the Fourier coverage moment by moment. And we've stitched together those images to make these movies up here. So this is our simulation. This is the blurred simulation. And this is our reconstruction that we make from stitching together all these different snapshots. And you can begin to see the evolution and the rotation curve around here. Now, this is the first time we've ever done this. So we're hoping that with better algorithms and with optimal placement of dishes, we can begin to see the orbital period here. And that is what we're after, because the innermost stable circular orbit of matter is a completely different test. And I'll tell you why. The size of the shadow is insensitive to spin. But the period of the matter orbits is exquisitely sensitive to spin. So it's about a factor of 10 difference between a non-spinning black hole and a fully spinning black hole. So measuring the period will nail the spin in a way that just the shape of the shadow will not. Uh, oh, so I do have this slide here. So, and, and the thing that we're very excited about, and not just us, but everyone should be very excited about this, is that uh, through the work of Michael Johnson, Alex Lupsoska, and others, we now know that that irregular ring that we see is really made up of an infinite number of subrings. Why? Because most of the light that we're seeing, if the black hole is here, is coming around the edge of the black hole. And, and, the, and th this is exactly right. And the n equals 1 ring, though, these are photons that make a U-turn around the black hole. And of course, for them to go all the way around in the curved space-time, they have to be scattered within a much narrow, solid angle. So it looks like it's very thin. And the n equals 2 ring, they're the ones that do a full loop-de-loop, -loop, a whole orbit around the black hole. So now these, this is only about 10% as bright as this ring. But if you have a very high angular resolution, this ring begins to be resolved. It goes away because of the spatial sensitivity of the interferometer, and you're left with this. So what we we're hoping to do with the next generation EHT is go to higher frequency, where we get higher resolution, and lock in on this feature instead of this feature. This will then do away with that empirical calibration that limits the precision with which we can test Einstein's theory now. But uh, this n equal 1 is inside, right, of n equal 0? Well, so here, so it's, it's well, n equals 0 is all around. And the n equals 1 ring here is this first bright ring, and the n equals 2 is this very, very thin filament that goes along. They always go interior. They're, they're asymptotic to the true photon orbit. Mm -hmm. 
Does that answer your question? Is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're like you. We're after that. So, um, and this just shows us some simulations that we've done. So we asked if we had this simulated image and we reconstructed things with just the EHT. Well, you can't see the ring. Um, uh, when you when you use, even when you use the NGHT, but you only use one frequency, you can't do it. It's when you use NGHT with 230 and 345, then you begin to recover that ring. So we think that with model fitting, we should be able to lock onto that razor sharp feature and then make this breakthrough of testing Einstein. And, and, and this is an effort that's ongoing, right? We, we have not solved this yet. I'm not gonna tell you we've solved this, but it's very exciting. Uh, and then we, we were talking about space, space. So we have someone from the space agency here. Um, we dream of space too. I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but uh, if you let the earth rotate, you can fill in that aperture very quickly. But if you had four low earth orbit satellites, you get near perfect coverage in hours. So this is really you know, one of our dreams. So we could make very, very uh, good images. And then if you were to put a telescope like the Origins telescope, at the second Lagrange point, which is one and a half million kilometers away, then the angular resolution is such that every black hole in the universe is now within range, right? Because of the turnover in the in the distance equation, right? In the in the in the metric, so you wind up seeing just about every black hole, and we could measure because of sensitivity maybe tens of thousands of black holes. So this is another possibility. So just a sum up, if this is the model that really what, if you were at the black hole and you had oxygen and you had a spacecraft and you had all that stuff, this might be what you would see. And the NGHT will begin to show these dynamics and really measure these. Uh, if you went out to geo orbit, you'd get a much clearer picture, right? So there's a, really a progression here. And I think that within maybe the lifetime of my children, <laughs> uh, this might actually happen uh, at some level. And, and now the most important thing, I, I used to think that the measurements were the most important thing about the project. But really now I've come to understand that the most important thing is building a team that will make this project happen. And we, we did reach across borders and we brought in expertise from all over the world. And more than that, we used resources from all over the world. And even more than that, we used the planet itself as our telescope. So in many ways, this was a truly a global effort tackling uh, a big challenge. And I like to think that it's uh, an exemplar that could be used for things like the pandemic or things like hunger or things like weapons proliferation and all the things, climate change, all the things that really face us as, uh, as humans. Um, I'm not, again, no promises, but we like what we, we're doing here. We're going to stay in our lane and just continue to do this. But if it helps others, then that'd be great. Um, the other uh, important thing were the early career people. Uh, this ran on the innovation and energy of the early career students and postdocs. So to all the early career people here, uh, you can make a huge difference in projects like this. Find something that you want to do, work with like-minded people, and it is, uh, it's altogether possible to make major contributions to a big project like this. And then uh, just the human dimension, people do seem to like this project. <laughs> uh, we were a little bit surprised, actually, because we had been so deep into it that we didn't really understand how it would be um, received by the community. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if you guys know Jeopardy. It's one of my favorite game shows when I was growing up. Uh, th this is a game show where they ask, um, uh, they, they give you the clue, like this. And you have to ask the question. So, of course, the answer to this one was a black, you know, what is a black hole, right? And so you guys aren't getting this. This is a US thing. <laughs> anyway, so this, is, so, so this is like a game show that's pretty popular. And it, it, was, it, was, it was one of the clues in the game show. So we knew we had arrived. You know. um, and, and that's all I'm, I, I really wanted to say. I just, I'll just end by asking, you know, I ask people sometimes, what would Einstein think? We all imagine that the titan of the field, like imagine Schwarzschild walked through the door, or Einstein walked through the door, like what kind of conversation would we have here? You know? And I, I like to think they would really be just in love with this work, as we are with theirs, right? So this is also the best in the, in the scientific tradition. We keep asking questions, we write Einstein's equations down every day, we solve them, 
Uh, he's as alive today as he would, ever was. And we hope this result will also stand the test of time and ask, enable even more questions. So thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for a fascinating talk on a fascinating topic. I'm sure that uh, there will be several questions. We are short of time, so please be concise. Mm -hmm. Carlos and Luciana. Okay, I have two questions. So, um, do you come so first, I would like to ask you, uh, what was your impression when you realized that after the matching of, of your simulation with the data, you get the, the inclination of the disk kind of pointing towards us, I mean, the, or the, the plane of the of the of the disk, uh, like like similar to maybe seven. But what would have expected that would be more kind of a yeah. or something? What, what was your, your so this your is this is a this is an issue that we, we are still puzzling over. We don't know the answer to that. Um, you would expect this is the Milky Way in the plane of the Milky Way. You would expect that you would see the black hole spinning like this and the North Pole would be up and the South Pole would be down. So why is this pointing towards us? That seems very odd. Now, the, the, the gravity instrument on the, on the VLTI uh, in uh, Paranal, they have also seen some infrared evidence that seems to suggest it's also face on. So that's all, that was another mystery. So either this corroborates that a little bit or we're all making the same mistake um, what I would say is that we need more observations to really understand that. If we could see the jet, that would really nail this down because then we would have a preferred direction, we would know the spin axis of the black hole. But th this is something of a mystery. It, it really is. And it, it could also just be the fact that we're trying to account for the fact that Sagittarius is changing and something in our algorithms is preventing us from seeing a little bit more of an asymmetry. I mean, so, so we don't see, here we see a very clear asymmetry. Here we don't, yeah. and that just tells you that we can't really tell much about the azimuthal distribution. Indeed, you have which is uncertainty in the inclination. You have uh, it's not. Uh, I, I think we do. I, I, it's it's a pretty big uncertainty. It's yeah. like at least thirty or forty yeah. percent. So. And the second question is: Could you comment a bit about the? the well, you already had two questions. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. 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 Go yeah, no, so uh, if you go a bit about the degeneracy you have in the results from the, because this is also generated with the, with the disk, surrounding disk parameters, right? That you, you talk much about the, the, where, the, where the photons come from. You have oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Which is not, not trivial because we don't know the, yeah, the, the yeah. physics of the disk. So if you come and Well, this is, there is some uncertainty there too. That typically comes in with the empirical calibration. So, for example, we ran these general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations, that's a mouthful, and we then know the emission structure. Then we ray trace all that emission structure through. Sometimes that emission structure is confined to the midplane of the accretion flow. Sometimes that emission structure is the inner wall of, the, of, of jets that initially start to come out. So there is an uncertainty because we don't know where that emission goes. All of those simulations can give us something that looks like this. We can't map one to one the ring that we see to the exact or origin point yeah. of those photons. And that's something that we'll have to do better with in the future. And, and there's already one student in, in my team who is working on um, modeling the exact 3D emission structure from the data itself and then ray tracing it through the warp space time. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going all the way back to just where are the photons born. Yeah. A very interesting point. Okay, nice. Thank you. Lucien. Yeah, I had two questions too. Um, the first one is, what uh, what is the next source that you're? In? Mm. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so probably with, with the EHT, there's no other source for which we can do this. With the NGHT, and I can say if, I'll say more about this in Salta. Um, a number of different objects come into range because we go higher in frequency and we get much higher dynamic range. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think the M31 is a very interesting source to look at. M84 is a very interesting source to look at. We've already looked at, at uh, Sen A in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, Sen A is a monster. Mm -hmm. Sen A is one of the brightest sources, you know, in the radio, and it's right here at a deck of negative 44. 
So this, in the southern hemisphere, that's a great source to look at. And we've mapped the, the, the jets from there, too. So probably with the EHT, we can't do many more sources. But with the NGHT, we think we can get of order 10, mm -hmm. maybe new sources, if we're lucky. And uh, the next short question is, uh, you mentioned before that there were four teams working independently. Um, so you're still working in that way, like each individual team working in their own? We're not. Office? We're not, actually. There's no more fried chicken. Okay. There's no more dogs. <laughs> That's the thing of the past. But now we know pretty much how to work with, the, with these data. We know the, uh, the dangers. And we're able to institutionalize um, you know, a good protocol. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to like, separate people in different rooms. We can bring them all together, but we have checks and balances. So we know we go through these all the time. All right. That's a good question. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Daniela? Yes. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the talk. It was very good. Um, do you expect when you uh, will, um, have a better solution on the ring? region of the total rate to see differences in general relativity? That's a great question. Um, I, I think that we'll do that when we get to the n equals 1 ring, because I, I think that the kind of deviations we would expect will be within the 17%, within the 10% that we're at right now. I mean, we haven't seen anything gross. We haven't seen anything big, right? With the n equals 1 ring, it's so thin. Uh, it, it has a width of only a couple of micro arc seconds that we should be able to model that and look for flattening if we, if we expect it for the spin or a non-circularity. And that's what would imply something that we really haven't thought of. So we, we are very much directed toward, towards that. And that will be a combination not just of the shape, but also we hope of the orbital period. And it will be the combination of those together that will allow us to, to tease out the degeneracies. Yes, yeah, please. Thank you for the talk. Um, I wonder, when you show the visibility light curves, mm -hmm. uh, the, the points and the models that fit that point, uh, how is uh, look like the shed in that visibility light curve? Because it's not the ring. How do you uh, separate the the ring structure of the black hole and the shed part. The what part? The shed. How do you separate the shed the contribution shed from the discontribution? I'm not getting the second word. The what contribution? The jet. The jet. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Now I understand. <laughs> now I understand. Well, because in the visibility light course, you, you yeah, yeah, yeah. model the ring. Okay. But so, yeah, so, so th this is a very interesting point. So, uh, what is your name? Carlos. Carlos. This is what Carlos was, was alluding to before, that uh, no matter where you start the photons, they are all lensed into a ring. So the ring we're looking at is not directly mappable to an accretion disk. The ring we're looking at is not necessarily mapped to the jet. But all the photons, they're so close in that they all get lensed around to be this ring. But this is not the accretion flow. No. But does that make sense? So, and, and I can't tell you which of these photons came from a jet, and I can't tell you which of these photons came from the accretion disk. And imagine that you, you show a greasy... 279? Yes. With the jet. Yeah, but that was for calibration purposes. Yeah, so no, but but but, but yeah, and, and, and but, but but that's at a z of I think 0.57. That's very far away. Yeah. That's like a gigaparsec away, and we're not seeing the black hole at all. We're seeing only the jet. Yeah. So we expect to see a core and a jet source, right? And and that is consistent with earlier observations of that of that source. Yeah. But these are great questions. This is you are clearly paying attention. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, any further question? Yes, please come in. Okay, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, um, all the, the potential future sources are supermassive black holes. Um, <clears throat> they are much bigger than a stellar black hole, but mm -hmm. they, they are much uh, farther away. Mm -hmm. um, it would be possible uh, to observe uh, a stellar black hole 
Yeah. It's a very good question. So we, I, I'll say something about this. Are you coming to Salta? No. Oh. Okay. So, um, well, so I'll give, you, I'll give you the answer now. The, um, so there are micro quasars. There are X-ray binary sources. There are you know, massive stellar sized black holes that evolve very, very fast. And they're within our galaxy. They are still too small. If you go through the, the math, they are still too small and they would require angular resolution far beyond what we can do right now. But we are going to observe those because we can see the jets evolve on, let's say, 10,000 RG, like right? 10,000 M or so, or 100,000 M with, with great precision, right? So we want to observe those as well as, um, as the supermassive black holes for different, for different purposes. We'll study the jets of those X-ray binaries and the microquasars. Uh, we can't test Einstein with them, but they're wonderful sources to observe. Yeah, this is a wonderful instrument to study jets, and, yeah. uh, different scales. Yeah. Many people here work on microquasars, so that is the origin ah. of the question. Okay. Okay. Now I know what I'm dealing with. <laughs> uh, any other question? No? Well, if not, let's thank Chef again, please. Okay, thank you. No, thank you to you. Very nice talk. Very